Morning, everybody. <coughs> Can't hear me. Morning, everybody. Good morning. Yes. <coughs> I'm going to try this again. Morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I have to start a little early because there's a lot on the agenda this morning. Welcome to Northport Community United Church of Christ, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are always welcome here. If you have a cell phone, we ask that you turn it off, turn it on silent, or leave it in the car, which is the best idea and double check it, because we don't need it going off during service. If you've not already done so, please take the red fellowship book at the end of the pew, sign it, pass it down, look to see who's sitting next to you. If you don't know them, greet them, and be sure to put the date in the upper right-hand corner. Welcome to Caroline, who is filling in for Charles for two weeks, who is always welcome here. <laughs> Morning, Caroline. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> Please check the church calendar in your bulletin for meeting activities and announce announcements. Note that Christian Ed, deacons, trustees, and council all meet this week. And please all join us for coffee hour following today's service. The deadline to order Thanksgiving pies is tomorrow. Order forms are in the narthex. These be Please be sure to read the report on the outcome of our third annual pumpkin patch in your bulletin. And Patty, I don't know where you're sitting, but congrats on all the work you put into organizing it. Where is she? Great job. Very nicely done, but a lot of work. Um, the rummage sale, please bring your items Thursday morning, I believe. And don't forget to sign up for next Sunday's Thanksgiving potluck. The sign-up sheet is in the fellowship hall. Trust me, you're going to want to be there. Just go in there and look who's what is signed up for already. There's like all kinds of pies and good stuff. And um, we hope to have you all here. And it'll be just a nice preliminary lunch before Thanksgiving. <laughs> uh, tomorrow is the last day to sign up for the Thanksgiving pies from Perkins. I already said that because somebody wrote it twice. Uh, we do have announcements. Um, I have one. Home Bible study is once a month on Thursdays, and this month it's the 15th. Uh, Dolores is looking for hosts, so if you'd like to host, please see Dolores and let her know. And she wouldn't come up here and announce. Now you have to sign, stand up, Dolores, so everybody knows who you are. There. <laughs> So if you'd like to host, see that lady with the pretty hair. <laughs> uh, Mary, do you need to talk about bread? It's time to talk about picking up the goodies from Publix again. Uh, starting with December, we have no one signed up. However, December is five Sundays, but you get a break because the first Sunday in December is already taken care of. So I need somebody to sign up for both picking up and delivering uh, goods so that we can have access to all of that wonderful stuff. And then the next month starts 2019. Here's the sheet for 2019, and it is blank. So um, I will be putting that up after church, and anybody who wishes to sign up for the months in January keep me from having to do all of this. Thank you in advance. Kim just said there is no cantata rehearsal today, but from next Sunday on, it will be every Sunday until the cantata, one to three, on Sunday afternoons. Uh, Pastor, looks like you have a announcement. Yes, good morning. Good morning. So let's see if we come up with that. Yes, so um, those of you who did not make it last year to our family retreat in parish, uh, that's by the Ellington Outlet Malls. We went to the Episcopal Retreat Center there. And guess what? That was at the beginning of May, and the second annual family retreat is already coming up. 
And um, so what did we do at this retreat? Well, it's at the Day Spring Retreat Center. So it's about a maximum seven minutes or so from the uh, 75 exit there by Ellington Mall. Um, it's beautiful nature, a great retreat center, and um, we are part of a spiritual growth experience. We had a guest speaker last year, or last time, I should say, and uh, we have great fellowship and great uh, food. And what else do we have? Uh, we have uh, great accommodations and amenities. I'm currently looking for a new residence, and the big keyword is amenities. What are the amenities? They have great amenities, so you should be coming and uh, experiencing those. Then we have fun and friendship. Um, there is a time for recreation, getting to know each other. And um, the last thing is, it's going to be February 28th through March 2nd, and it's now time for you to make up your mind to be part of that. And if you look at that group photo, my question is, what's missing on it? You. you. If you didn't go last year, you are missing on it. So we can't wait for you to join us this year. Thank you. Sandy? First of all, I'd like to say Happy Veterans Day to all our veterans. And being Veterans Day is a good time to honor your loved ones and veterans by buying a brick for $50 and have it placed in our veterans or memorial walkways. Also, for $150, get your name on the plaque, which entitles your ashes, if you wish, to be put there and helps with the perpetual care of the garden. So forms are in the back in the narthex, and you can either see me after church or call the office. Thank you. I want to make sure I'm not missing anything. <clears throat> Do we have any first time visitors? Don't be shy. Put up your hand. <laughs> Way to go. <laughs> Welcome. Are you visiting from someplace or do you live here in Northport? Oh, welcome to our world. It's warmer here than there. <laughs> it is time for the noisy coin offering. And the offering will be used for breakfast with Santa today. I'm not, I don't know if I'm supposed to acknowledge these boxes here, but how can you not acknowledge them? <clears throat> I heard um, somebody say we almost have double. It was kind of fun trying to find all kinds of things to put in there. <laughs> I think that does it. 
Let us be in the worship. So, but God shows his love for us um, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, 8. What does that scripture tell us? Friends, it tells us that Christ died before you fixed your life. Christ died for us while we needed him the most. And he's inviting us today, and I can't think of a better hymn to start out with than Amazing Grace. Let's stand for that and sing it together. I'm not going to say to be seated because we're going to um, 
ask the children to come forward at first, and then uh, we are going to, um, as best as we are able to, make a circle around these boxes that have been so lovingly prepared by you, and we're going to pray for them um, so that the children that are going to receive them in whatever part of the world they're in, they would feel, listen to me, they would feel the love of God come right out of that material thing that's in there, as much as fun as it is for the children to open something on Christmas Eve, but we want them to feel the love of God. Are you agreed in that? And that's what we're going to pray for. So let's uh, form a circle around this, and, um, and we're going to do that. that Boo said, we're going to want to double it and go for 100, right? Is that what you said? And so we are at 115 or maybe even more are going to come in. There's 100, 117. Um, so who is going to bid more? 117. Who's going for 120? Uh, so anyway, um, that's 120 lives. 120 children that we might face to face never meet, but then who knows? And when they're gonna open that box, it's our prayer that they would feel the love of God. And um, what I want us to do is I want us to take a moment of silence, close your eyes, and um, if you uh, package the box, um, um, whether or not it's uh, what matters is that we're thinking about the child that's going to open that box. Let's take a moment of silence and pray what is on your heart regarding that, that life, that child. Lord, we pray for every child that is going to open these boxes. Um, and whatever setting they're going to be in, whether it's in their private home or in a big gathering or at a school, at a church, wherever, Lord, in whatever part of the world, that the moment they opened this box, they couldn't help but feel the love of God pour into their hearts and lives. We thank you for this mission. We thank you for all those who contributed and made it possible. And I want us to step closer and place your hands on these boxes, all of us. Just, if you can, reach a box and, and put your hand on it. Lord, we pray uh, for the love of God uh, to be evident in these gifts. They're material things, but we trust that you will use them as a tool to reveal your love to every child. And we thank you for it already. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. And now that you're standing, why don't you greet someone? <laughs> Hi there, good to see you.
Okay, if we can find our seats slowly uh, uh, back, back to our seats, that would be great. I know you're having so much fun, but all fun must come to an end. And we're going to have the choir sing for us. Um, so let's give them a hand before they even sing. It began as Armistice Day in 1919, uh, when they celebrated the end of World War I. November 11th has been celebrated as Veterans Day in the United States since 1954. Many people, including us, we observe the day with ceremonies and parades that honor 
the sacrifice and dedication of those who have served in the armed forces of the United States. And there may truly be no better way to honor a veteran than in prayer, whether it is offered in a church service like here, or privately or silently as a parade passes by, or in a personal card or note, prayer can connect you, a veteran, and God in a meaningful and productive way. I'm going to ask all the veterans in our sanctuary to please stand at this time. Let us pray. God, please let every veteran of our nation's armed forces feel truly and appropriately honored by the attention and appreciation of their fellow citizens. Let no one feel forgotten or neglected. Let every man and woman, young or old, feel the deep and enduring gratitude of our nation and its inhabitants. Amen. Sunday school is excused now. They're going next door, and they're going to have lots of fun over there. All right, so we're going to celebrate also birthdays, and as is tradition in our congregation on Sunday morning, birthdays and anniversaries. Anybody celebrating a birthday today? You are. Should I bring the hat? Are you going to wear it? You don't have to. You rather not? Okay. Uh, you want to put it on? Or mom wants you to put it on? <laughs> so when is your birthday? Tuesday. Tuesday. And uh, any surprises in coming towards you? Do you know? <laughs> you don't know? Well, God bless you and a very happy birthday to you. Yes, she already did. Okay. So God bless you on your birthday and always. Anybody else? Oh. Okay. Let's see if I can squeeze through here. Uh, Joseph. Joseph. Now, I think you are the kind who would wear the hat for oh, him. <laughs> 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 All right. So happy birthday to him as well. Anybody else on this side? Anniversary. Whose anniversary? Your anniversary. Yes. This coming Thursday, 50 years. 50 years. I'm sorry. Whoa. I'm way behind. 60 years. Oh. <laughs> well, congratulations to you, um, Grace and Howard. God bless you. Thank you. So that's your 60th anniversary. May I ask how you met? Kind of a long story, but I met her at a friend's house. And I said, this is one good-looking girl. <laughs> and then I found out she had an identical twin. And she was, with her, she was with her boyfriend. When I found out she had an identical twin, I asked, is she going with anybody? And they said, no. I said, fix me up. All right, well, congratulations. I, actually, I just saw her sister three or four times that I didn't ever saw her for three or four months. I met her on the street. I asked how her boyfriend was, don't see him anymore. I said, what are you doing Friday night? <laughs> yeah, okay, well, that's great. Wonderful story. I'm going to ask more often. This is good. <laughs> All right, anybody else? Yes. Oh, where's the hat? Where is it? Oh, there it is. Mine, I, you look like you might want to wear the hat. There you go. Oh, you did say no? I didn't hear it. Sorry. When is your birthday? Today. Today. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you very much. I won't tell you how old I am. 16. 16 and holding, yeah. 16 and holding. Happy birthday to you. Wonderful. Yep. Anybody else that I'm missing? Oh, back there. That's okay. No hat. Okay, you're good. 
Um, Bill and I are celebrated our 20th wedding anniversary November 6th. Congratulations. <laughs> Wonderful. How did you meet? Well, I was getting estimates for replacement windows for my house, and he was the salesman. <laughs> so he came as a bonus with the windows. <laughs> yeah, he was selling and I was buying. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, congratulations. That's wonderful. You never know what the bonus will be. All right. Okay, well, if not, then let's sing happy birthday and happy anniversary. Paul writes in the book of Ephesians to the Ephesian congregation, he says, we serve the God who parcels out heaven and earth. What a powerful way to say that our God is almighty. He can do anything. If you came to our movie yesterday, that was the whole message. God, there's nothing that's impossible for our God. And so that's why we pray for those that are ill. That's why we believe that God has a breakthrough for you and God has a provision for you. So what are some of the things that we're praying for this morning? Why don't we call out those prayer requests? Can we get one of those microphones that will just move? Okay, where's Mike? I have two uh, major concerns. First of all, for David, for his sister, who we have just found is quickly going to be going to the Lord. So if you don't see us next week, that may be that we're going north. Uh, and someone who is a friend of our church, okay, uh, is going through a difficult time, and that's Ruth Barker. Mm -hmm. Those of you that were on retreat last year remember Ruth as well. And uh, she uh, had a PET scan this past week. And um, in a PET scan, if there is something that is generally malignant, it lights up. And on one of her kidneys, they have found this. She's going in tomorrow for a biopsy. So she, I saw her last night at the, uh, the movie. And uh, I asked her, and she said, please, uh, ask you for prayers for her because she's a really good person and uh, very concerned for her. So we pray for Ruth and David, your sister's name. Patricia. Lord God, we pray for Andrea and David as uh, you know what's going on in his heart as he thinks about his sister, Lord. Um, we pray uh, in her condition where she is at that you would make that bed the palm of your hands and uh, step near that um, situation, uh, minister to her heart, and whatever conditions she is in, you can reach her. And I pray that you give her peace and uh, give her comfort and strength and um, just help her to call on your name for help because you're right there. And we pray for Ruth and her fears and her concerns and her health. We pray for her to be healthy. And as she's going to have this biopsy done, we pray that you just give her your peace that's so supernatural that when she steps into that facility, she knows my God is on my side. And we pray for Ruth to be healed and healthy in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes. No, you just... Uh, throw something at me. Oh, okay. Um, this is a celebration for a co-worker, Mary, who received a kidney transplant on Friday. Wow. Mary. Lord God, we just um, feel right now here with Lynn on behalf of her co-worker. Um, we just pray that you bless Mary with good health. We thank you for the donation that was given so that she could live healthy and strong. And we thank you for the gift of life in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, prayers for Karen Rout, who's uh, going through such ordeals between the cancer and breaking hips and legs, and uh, it's just awful. But she really is appreciative of all the prayers that we have been giving her, and she is healing, and she is very uplifted by all our prayers. 
Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are completely aware of Karen's situation, and we pray that she would, um, in all her trials and difficulties, um, uh, feel your presence. That's so important. And uh, we pray that she would be healed from any sickness and disease and that she would be healthy and be back in our midst very quickly and soon. And also, I want to pray for Karen Murphy, Lord, and her recovery. Strengthen her and bless her, Lord. Um, there are others um, that need our prayers that are ill. We pray that your healing power would flow right through their physical bodies so that they would be restored to good health and strength. In Jesus' name, amen. Anybody else? Yes. Just prayers for everyone in California with the fires and uh, losing their houses and homes and special prayers for all our military that's around the world right now that we don't lose anybody today. Yeah. Lord God, we do pray for um, our armed forces around the world, like Tony said, and we pray your hedge of protection around them. We pray for wars to cease in this world and for your peace to reign within and without. And we pray for the dear people in California, uh, many of them who have lost um, all belongings and uh, are living in fear and uncertainty, um, that you would make these fires cease and that you would bring peace and restoration and redemption in your son Jesus. We pray for the churches in those areas to be able to help in an effective way in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes. We have a friend by the name of Joe who is battling leukemia. He needs our prayers. Lord God, we uh, thank you that we can pray for Joe and uh, that you are uh, with him. Uh, we claim those words that John Wesley said, that the best of everything is that God is with us. And we pray that uh, Joe would feel that. And, um, and uh, I pray for Don and Jan, Lord, that your blessing would uh, just be upon them and your strength and your well-being in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so, yes. I uh, wanted to, uh, for D. Cruz, who was up in Ohio, she had to get out of the hospital, and then she had to re-enter the hospital again last week because of her pneumonia and congestive heart failure, but they let her out yesterday, so she's home trying to recuperate again. Lord God, we thank you that we can agree together as a congregation on behalf of Dee and uh, her heart condition, uh, the pneumonia and everything, Lord. We thank you that she's back home now, and we pray that you give her strength day after day. In Jesus' name, amen. How many of you have an unspoken request this morning? Raise your hand high. That's a lot of people, and God knows even if you don't say a word, he knows what's uh, on our mind and on our hearts. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you hear those prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to bring our tithes and offerings at this time, and then we're going to sing together.
Heavenly Father, yes, we do. We praise Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in our midst. May these offerings bless many lives. Thank you for them. Amen. Let's remain standing, and we're going to sing together um, before the message and the scripture reading, hymn number 165 in your pew hymnal, um, Rejoice the Lord is King, one of Charles Wesley's favorite, uh, f uh, famous hymns, I should say. And Carolyn is a Methodist, and she's going to play it for us. All right, go right ahead. Thank you. You may be seated. You know, I listened to those words that he wrote, and I tell you what, it can't get more solid theology than what he's writing there. It's like a summary of scriptural message. It's wonderful, and I'm grateful for those hymns. We're reading Romans chapter 8 in our series on the life of John Wesley and the Methodist movement in our Reformation series. I'm reading verses 1 through 11 from the message, and you can follow along on the screen. Uh, <clears throat> With the arrival of Jesus, the Messiah, that fateful dilemma is resolved. Those who enter into Christ's um, uh, being here for us no longer have to live under a continuous low-lying black cloud. A new power is in operation. The spirit of life in Christ, like a strong wind, has magnificently cleared the air freeing you from a faded lifetime of brutal tyranny at the hands of sin and death. God went for the jugular when he sent his own son. He didn't deal with the problem as something remote and unimportant. unimportant. In his son, Jesus, he personally took on the human condition, entered um, the disordered mess of struggling humanity in order to set it right once and for all. Everybody say once and for all. The law code, weakened as it always was by fractured human nature, could never have done that. The law always ended up uh, being used as a band-aid on sin instead of a deep healing of it. And now that the law code asked for uh, but we couldn't deliver is accomplished as we, instead of redoubling our own efforts, simply embrace what the Spirit is doing in us. Those who think they can do it on their own end up obsessed with measuring their own moral muscle but never get around to exercising it in real life. Those who trust God's action in them find that God's Spirit is in them, living and breathing God. Obsession with self in these matters is a dead end. Attention to God leads us into the open, into a spacious, free life. Uh, focusing on the self is the opposite of focusing on God. Anyone completely absorbed in self ignores God, ends up thinking more about self than God. That person ignores who God is and what he is doing, and God isn't pleased 
at being ignored. So everybody say, God isn't pleased at being ignored. But if God himself has taken up residence in your life, you can hardly be thinking more of yourself than of him. Anyone, of course, who has not welcomed this invisible but clearly present God, the Spirit of Christ, won't know what we're talking about. But for you who welcome him, in whom he dwells, even though you still experience all the limitations of sin, you yourself experience life on God's terms. It stands to reason, doesn't it, that if the alive and present God who raised Jesus from the dead moves into your life, he'll do the same thing in you that he did in Jesus, bringing you alive to himself. When God lives and breathes in you, and he does, as surely as he did in Jesus, you are delivered from that dead life with his spirit living in you. Your body will be alive in Christ. So far, God's eternal word. Let's uh, turn to him in prayer briefly one more time. Lord God, I have to admit, uh, these words are deep, um, and uh, this is the easy translation. And yet we wonder, oh, what is all this about? And it truly is about what we read at the very beginning, and that with you, with Jesus, the whole transformation has happened, and all we have to do is say yes to that gift that you offer to us in your Son, in your one and only Son. Uh, we look at the life of John Wesley, and we pray that you help us to learn from it. And Lord God, I pray that you breathe life into my message. If not, it will only be letters on a piece of paper. And we pray that nothing would disturb us. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're looking at the life of John Wesley. This is uh, our third time that we're focusing on his life. Um, and so I would like us to go to the first slide. This is what we left off with last week. Next one, please. Um, there it is. So life uh, for John Wesley wasn't easy. He came to America. He did missionary work in Georgia. We learned about all of that, how he came to the New World, trying to preach the gospel to a group of people with that hope that he could preach in a childlike language to a people who maybe for the very first time would hear it. Um, and the image that we left off with is that image out of the Old Testament that God is the potter and we are the clay in his hands. And I tell you what, when you let that really happen, um, the experience itself can be a tough one. And uh, it can be messy, just like that man's hand on that potter's wheel is all filled up with that clay, with that wet material as it's preparing. And um, Romans talked about the law and what it accomplished. And then it talked about what Jesus accomplished, which means Jesus brought life to us. And then the next slide tells us about what the Reformation is all about. Ecclesia reformata, semper reformanda, the church reformed, always reforming. So we cannot sit down and say, well, our ancestors did a great job, then now we're going to just rest on their accomplishments. But for our generation, for this life, for this community, for this country, and for this time, we need to figure out how do we share the gospel in a way so that people can identif identify with it, can relate with it. That's our task. So John Wesley's experience as a missionary in North America, in Georgia, I mean, I don't want to call it a disaster, but it certainly wasn't a success. Uh, he came away uh, disappointed, and, but there was one positive thing that he brought with him. He had encountered this group of Christians that were called, that we call the Moravians. And um, uh, there he met a gentleman by the name of Gottlieb, uh, August Gottlieb Spangenberg, who uh, later became the leader of the Moravian movement. And um, he saw the convictions that these Moravians had. And if you remember about when they were going uh, over to America, how the ship was about to sink, and these people had no fear. I mean, that's a big deal if somebody doesn't have fear in the, eyes, uh, in the eye of the storm. And they had no fear. The, the, the ship was about to be swallowed up, but they finished singing their psalm. Do you remember that? And it left such a deep impression on him because he saw that they had something that he was still missing. He came away from America with this void on the inside. And uh, so he arrives in London, England on February 3rd, 1738, after a very tiring trip. And um, he carries in him this experience 
um, how these Moravians carried their faith on a daily basis. Well, I know about you, but I need church um, just as much as you do. I happen to stand here and preach to you the Word of God, but before I preach it to you, I parallel preach it to myself. That's why I don't like the pulpit to be up here. The pulpit really should be down here. Because I'm in the same boat, I have the same struggles, I have the same uh, fears, I have the same joys. I am in the same boat like you are. The only reason why I'm really up here is because we have a great guy by the name of Mike who put up a screen here for me, and I think I'm probably the only pastor who has such a thing. I love it. I stick to it. I like reading from there. It helps me to keep in line with the message. But we need church, but I tell you what, I need God even more on Monday. Everybody needs God here right now. We're all in agreement. Yeah, we are here to worship God, but I need God on Tuesday, and I need, it on, I need Him on Wednesday, and then all throughout the week. I need Him every day of my life. Say yes if you agree. Yes. So as he comes back to London, he meets a gentleman by the name of Peter Bula, who had very strong ties also with the Moravians, and Peter, Peter was only 25 years old, but he becomes John Wesley's mentor. And I tell you what, mentorship has nothing to do with age. It does have to do with experience, and it does have to do a lot with maturity and faith, but a younger person in the church can be a mentor to an older person. And we're not discriminating. Young, old, who cares, right? The main thing is that it's the maturity in faith that made this Peter Bula be a mentor to Wesley. Wesley was very discouraged because of his distorted faith. He looked at, P P uh, at Peter Bula and also August Gottlieb Schwangenberg and the Moravians and said, well, they have such an unattainable level of faith. Do you feel sometimes like that? You look at other people and you compare yourself to them and you say, well, I'll never be where they are at. Don't you put a period where God put a comma. Does that sound familiar? Don't put an end where God is still working, where God hasn't finished yet. And so um, this Peter Buller said to him, uh, so, uh, so Wesley's decision was, well, I'm going to stop preaching. I'm going to stop doing the, word of, the work of God till I have this change of heart, till I have this experience. And Peter Bula, in much wisdom, said to him, no, that's not what you should be doing, but what you should be doing is you should be preaching the Word of God till you get it. Don't stop. And those of you who came to the movie yesterday when the, the, that young guy had to do the death crawl, what, was the, what is the, what the coach kept saying? Don't stop, don't stop, don't stop. So he said, don't give up. But keep preaching, keep doing the Word of God till something happens on the inside of you. And so um, uh, Wesley listened to him, even though he had his doubts on that, on that method. And one of the things that, they, that he had left off when they went to the New World was prison ministry. Did you know that, the, that the, um, uh, the Methodists were one of the first ones to do active prison ministry? And so he decided that he's going to laugh, uh, uh, pick up where he left off, and he was looking for his first opportunity to minister to someone in prison. And God opened the door. There was a man who was on death row. And I, th I tell you what, if somebody's on death row, uh, they're not going to want to talk to you about the weather that's outside. They're going to want to talk about what really matters. And so John Wesley went and talked to him about the salvation plan of God and about Jesus and that this man could have eternal life before he dies. Because that's the key. We don't get eternal life after we die. We get it before we go to heaven. Does that make sense? Because it has to be here before that act happens. And so this man got saved on death row and it was a wonderful experience to Wesley and it, it was a step further in his desire um, to have what the Moravians have, what Peter Bula had, and those Christians that he encountered. And so um, he um, studied the Scriptures. Wesley kept studying the Scriptures, and two things kept coming up in the teachings of Jesus and in the entirety of Scripture. And these two words, are, or these thoughts, are being born again and conversion. 
And he didn't quite understand that because he thought, well, I've served God all my life. I've been in church all my life. What do I need, what do I need conversion from? What do I need being born again for? What does born again mean? And Nicodemus asked the same question. He said, well, I can't go back into my mother's womb and be born again. And Jesus said, no, you're not getting it. Being born again has to do something with your heart. How many of you know, and, de and they called Christianity in the Methodist movement a religion of the heart? It's in our hearts. That's where we find Jesus. That's where he is. That's where he dwells. In you, right now. In us, right now. And so he looked at John 3.16. Let's look at that scripture. I'm reading it from the message. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, his one and only son. And this is why. So that no one need be destroyed by believing in him. Anyone can have a whole and lasting life. So how does born again happen? Believe in Jesus. Not your grandmother's faith, faith, not your pastor's faith, not your music director's faith, not your pianist's faith, not the Pope's faith, but your faith. My faith. That's how it happens. It becomes a personal matter, a religion of the heart, as uh, they worded it. So the turning point for Wesley came May 24, 1738 at 5 a.m. He opened the Bible to the Greek New Testament and he started reading 2 Peter 1.4. Let's look that up. It says, We were also given absolutely terrific promises to pass on to you your tickets to participation in the life of God after you turned your back on a world corrupted by lust. And so he looks at that and he says, I have the ticket. Not the Mega Millions ticket or the Powerball ticket, but better than any of that, the ticket into heaven. Because guess what? The only thing we're going to take with us to heaven is our soul. That's all. Nothing else. And Dr. Billy Graham said it so well. He said, I've never seen, never seen a funeral procession with a hearse behind it. Uh, we haven't. And it's true. That's all we're going to take with us is our soul, who we are on the inside. And so, before leaving the house that morning, he opened the Word of God to the Gospel of Mark. And there, Jesus is saying to one of the teachers of the law these wonderful words. He says, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And Wesley read that and he said, I wish Jesus would say that to me. You're not far from the kingdom of God. It's like God in Jesus putting his hands on your shoulder, Christine, and saying, job well done. That's all we want to hear, right? When this life is over, we want to just hear job well done. Not perfectly, not without fault, not without struggles, and not without failures even, but your best. And what is God looking for this morning? I have some good news for you. He's not looking for anything else. It's so simple. Just our hearts. Open it up wide and say, God, come in. Come in. Let me experience that. And that's what, what, what Wesley was looking for. And so um, in the afternoon of that same day, he visited St. Paul's Cathedral, um, and in the message there, in Psalm 130, verse 4, um, God spoke to him. As it turns out, forgiveness is your habit, and that's why you are worshipped. That's talking about God. Did you know God's forgiveness is something that he habitually does? It says in the scripture, if you mess up, you go to God and say, just real simple, Lord, I'm so sorry that I said that. Lord, I'm so sorry I acted that way. Lord, I'm so sorry that I thought those things. They were terrible things to think about. And then God says, it's okay, let's start all over again. That motivates me to talk about God. Like we said at the beginning, you don't have to fix up your life and then come to God and say, well, I think I'm pretty clean right now. Can you accept me? No, you can come just as you are. Isn't that what we sing? Just as you are. And I'm, I don't know about your life, but sometimes that's pretty ugly when it comes to me. Just as you are. 
not all cleaned up, not all in my best clothes, but the mess that I am, here I am, God, what can you do with it? And watch him do it. Watch him work it out. And so that's what Wesley was walk, looking for. He was looking for that experience. It's God's habit to forgive you if you ask for it. He was deep in thought, and rather unwillingly, he went to a meeting that evening in Aldersgate Street. There should be another slide here. This is what it looks like today. And in this meeting, they were reading Martin Luther's introduction to the letter um, of, um, of Paul to the Romans. And it was at 8.45 p.m. when they came to the point where they read this. It is the con and this is the condensed form. In essence, that faith is God's work within us. I mean, did you know that you can't even believe on your own if you want to? Even faith is a gift from Him. And then, uh, which changes us and gives us new birth, a new way of thinking, and renews our intentions and brings the Holy Spirit with it. Wesley wrote later, I knew from that moment on that I wanted to build my entire life on Christ and in this work of salvation continue. I had one assurance of the fact that Christ had saved me, me indeed, from the law of sin and death. He shared uh, with the people present his experience, and now he had no longer the need to talk to Peter Böhler or Spangenberg or the Moravians. He had an experience for himself. And that's, that's so key. It has to be our experience. Luke 11, are you still with me? Or are you sitting at the lunch table already? <laughs> Here's what I'm saying. Ask and you will get. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. Don't bargain with God. Be direct. Ask for what you need. This is not a cat and mouse hide and seek game we are in. So what are you in need of today? I mean, I could come up with a whole list of what I need. And I'm sure you do too. How long is your list? Sometimes we feel like, well, there's no end to it. That's how many needs we have. But our God can do anything. He parcels off heaven and earth. Isn't that what we said? All right. So he becomes the motivated evangelist after this. He became the carrier of good news. In 1738, Wesley was able to fulfill one of his long dreams. He went to visit Nikolaus Ludwig von Zinzendorf and the Moravians in Herrenhag. That's what it looks like today, and this is what it looked like around 1750. So he goes there to kind of like uh, see firsthand what life was like in that community. And then he returns early in 1739. Oh, well, um, let me see. He also visited the August Hermann Franke institutions. If we go to the next slide, that was him, 1663 till 1727. And this man was revolutionary in German education. So schools are named after this man today because of his social reforms and school reforms that he brought. And together with George Whitfield, who also came to America, Wesley and him um, devised a plan how to evangelize England how to get the word out. Because I don't know about you, but there's something about the walls of the church that keeps people outside. Did you notice that? You know why that is? Because people are afraid that if they come here less than perfect, they will be judged. And unfortunately, sometimes they are, and that's a sin. Get it? I'm saying, Attila, do you get that? It's a sin to judge someone who is seeking God. And that's why there is a, an obstacle in the walls of the church, an invisible separation when a newcomer comes in and they're not fitting our agenda or our way of behavior. Well, for heaven's sake, it wasn't all too long ago and I didn't fit it. Yeah. Oh, not my, surely. And this be, marked the beginning of evangelism. On February 17th of modern day, open sky, open air, not under the roof of a church, evangelism. Um, Whitfield preached on, the, on February 17th, 1739, uh, to a crowd of several thousand people in an open air meeting in style of the apostles. The clerics in the Anglican church were very anti these meetings and started asking the masses to turn against Whitfield and his followers. 
But Whitfield said that even if the doors of the church would have remained open and the pulpits would have remained open, eventually this change would have happened. And so what Whitfield began, Billy Graham carried out in our days. Isn't that what he did? Open air meetings? Rain or shine? I went to a crusade of Billy Graham, and I'm telling you, when the whole city, and I'm not kidding you, I mean, it seemed like the whole city came to a standstill, and we were all flocking towards the big soccer stadium with the underground, and traffic really came to a standstill. I never forget the black clouds that were gathering. I, it looked like we we're going to have a big storm of rain. And I think it was... Um, Barrows is his name. I can't think of uh, his first name now. But he, what is it? Cliff Barrows. Well, Barbara, I'm impressed. <laughs> Cliff Barrows said, folks, we need to pray that there would be no rain. And guess what happened? There was no rain. And it didn't look like it wasn't going to happen. Man, I, it, it, there, those clouds were so dark, I thought, if this isn't going to happen, God is definitely in it. And it did not rain. Not a single drop of rain came um, during that meeting. And, you know, Wesley really struggled with this, actually. Um, then he, um, Whitfield, you know, with this whole open-air thing, he was too bound still at the Anglican church's system. And uh, Whitfield, at one point, he was preaching at a church where there were a thousand people packed inside, several, uh, another thousand were waiting outside, and several hundred had to go home because, because the church was too limited. And then... Um, George Whitfield preaches in 1739 in Bristol, in the Kingswood Hills, in front of hard-faced, black-faced miners who would never go to a church. And he preached to them, and they loved it. Now, Wesley still struggled with this. Wesley's voice was rather weak. He was small in stature. He had a determined voice, but nothing like George Whitfield's voice. And um, so what happens is... Um, that more and more of the churches closed their doors. They were not allowed to preach within the Anglican church. They were not allowed to hold meetings, and they started holding, uh, building their own or fi founding their own so uh, societies. They called them Methodist societies, and that's the John Wesley Chapel in Bristol. And if you want to know what happens after this, come back next week. Let's stand and pray. Let's stand and pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you for Methodism. We thank you for people that have gone ahead of us. We thank you for their faith. We thank you for the inspiration that we can get from them. And we pray that you put our hearts on fire um, with preaching the gospel in a way like it's never been preached before so that people would be blessed and helped. And that includes us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, before we do what we need to do, Somebody was in my office, I don't know who they were, and they lost their wedding band. So if it's you, come on and get it, or I'll put it in one of these boxes and you'll never know what happens. <laughs> so I have a wedding band that belongs to someone, you better come and get it. Uh, so what are we doing now? We're singing 547, 1, 2, and 4, God of our Fathers.
God bless you and keep you. God smile on you and gift you. God look you full in the face and make you prosper, now and always. Amen.